second summer read-along series, and we're really excited to have you with us today as we focus on the spring 2023 magazine cover story, The Power of Place, Art as a Tool for Social Justice. My name is Lindsay Shelton. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program manager for community advocacy partnerships at Learning for Justice. Today, I'm really excited to have a dialogue with the author of our cover story, as well as three incredibly talented artists from Montgomery, Alabama. Cassandra Dillard is an associate editor for Learning for Justice. Cassandra, please tell us more about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Cassandra Dillard. I use the pronouns she, her. Um, I've been with SPLC for over five years now, started as staff writer, then senior writer. Um, I'm a Texas native and have a journalist background. And uh, with this particular story was... I really love because I have a love for art and writing. So it came together um, the way that I that I had hoped it would come together. But yeah. Thank you. Kalanji Gilchrist is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit 21 Dreams Art and Culture. Kalanji, what else should folks know about you? All right. Uh, can you hear me? We cool. can hear you. Yeah. All right, uh, Montgomery native, uh, son of the South. Uh, my experiences has really, my experience in, in growing up here has really influenced uh, the work that I do. Um, I often say that that work is between arts, culture, uh, community and tech. Um, I'm a filmmaker and I also have a, um, a background in tech and IT work. So, yeah. Awesome. Milton Madison has helped create several murals here in Montgomery and his work has been featured at the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture, the Birmingham mm -hmm. Public Library and the Rosa Parks Museum. Milton, please introduce yourself. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I'm Milton Madison. Um, from Birmingham, Alabama, been in Montgomery since 95, uh, affiliated with 21 Dreams, uh, the King's Canvas, and a lot of other uh, local artists here in Montgomery. Uh, I did the Are You Listening mural, and I'm excited to be a uh, part of this panel. Yeah, thanks for being here, Milton. Finally, we have Sunny Polk. Sunny is a senior designer at SBLC where she has worked for 15 years. Please tell us more about you, Sunny. Thanks so much, Lindsay. It's great to be here. Thanks, everybody. Um, I was born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama, basically been an artist my whole life. Um, really started to come into large format mural painting um, around 2014, 2015 and was awarded the first commission uh, that, the, that the city asked for um, so the summer to Montgomery Voting Rights March anniversary in 2015. Okay. Um, so that really piqued my interest in doing more public art and getting uh, more involved in arts as activism. Awesome. We're also grateful to be joined by Kathy Smith today, who is providing ASL interpretation for us. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A feature rather than the chat box so we can capture your questions. Closed captioning is also available during this session, which is being recorded and will be available later on our website along with a transcript. Before we get into our dialogue, I want to share a bit about our read along series. This series was created to go beyond what's on the pages of our magazine to give you insight into the story creation process and to learn more from the people who we feature in our magazine. We hope it helps you learn more about the story topics and how you can use what you learn from the magazine in your classrooms and your communities. I'm really excited to be hosting today because we believe art is such an important tool for social justice, for storytelling, and for moving people to action, and that's why we're highlighting this article today. Cassandra has written a beautiful piece about how Alabama artists are depicting honest history and challenging historical invisibility to reshape public narratives of justice in their communities. So I'd like to start with you, Cassandra, because it seems like you had a really difficult job. Uh, Montgomery is filled with talented artists. How did you select the artists that you featured in the story? Yes, um, there's art all over Montgomery. 
and a lot of artists. Luckily, I work with some artists, Sunny being a colleague. Uh, she was one of the first people that I that I reached out to, as well as Kalanji. I know that Kalanji had had worked with SPLC before on our mural and some other uh, projects. Um, so I wanted to connect with both of them, and they were help, helpful with me getting some background about the art movement here in Montgomery. Um, and I specifically wanted to reach out to Milton because I think his mural really is central to the article. It embodies everything um, that I wanted to come across, which is teaching local history, speaking truth to power and moving people to action or at least to have conversation. Um, one thing I wanted to do um, in tapping some of the artists is I wanted to make sure that we uplifted black artists because historically they're not always given a platform, they're not always invited to gallery spaces, but I saw what the black artists were doing here in Montgomery in terms of mentoring and supporting up and coming artists and the work that they were doing to, as you said, combat invisibility and, and counter a narrative. I wanted to hear their stories and lift those. Yeah, and you mentioned Milton's um, mural being sort of central to the story. And Milton, when we open the magazine to read this story, we see your mural. Can you share a bit about this mural and how you envision educators and students might have a dialogue about it? Um, so when the um, George Floyd incident occurred, um, Kalanji, myself, uh, Dwayne Ferry, a few of us were in the group chat. And we conversed uh, often and frequently during that time about just what we were seeing and what we were experiencing. And it kind of, this kind of started from there. Some of the, the things that we were seeing across the nation with some of the murals, you were seeing like on the roads that uh, justice type murals that were being done on the streets and you would get these aerial shots. So, you know, with Montgomery being the, uh, birthplace of civil rights we just started thinking about what can we do and, and there was a conversation that we had one day and i started drawing and from there i showed you guys a picture and one thing led to another and the opportunity to uh you know visually depict this image on a building you know kalanji and 21 dreams made that happen they got with um leadership montgomery and some of the other local community activists we figured out where to do it, how to do it, what would be the best place to do it in. And we just came together and made it happen. And we wanted to make a statement uh, about police brutality and what we have been seeing, some of the things that had happened here locally with the uh, Greg Gunn incident and um, Ty Road incident. Uh, you guys with me? Yeah, we're okay. still here. So um, that, was, that was how it kind of culminated. And so how do you think that your mural could be used um, by educators or in community learning spaces to um, have a conversation about police brutality or have a conversation about the murder of George Floyd? Um, for, first of all, I think when you when you look at what the relationship with the police and the people are, you know, if you if you a community, then you speak you're supposed to be policed by members of the community, people of the community, uh, someone that has love for the community. And I, I think that that's important. So that relationship between the police and the community is important. Um, the, the justice or the injustice when there is a lack of accountability, that part is important. So that's what we saw the people doing and not just standing by idly, you know, and, and there have been a lot of times where, you know, things have been happening and, and the world has spoken out. People speak out and they have things that they wanted to say, but for some reason at that instance, it seemed our unheard voices were the loudest during that time when our mouths were, uh, I guess, muffled or covered by the masks because of, you know, COVID. But the attention there were no other distractions, you know, the world had kind of stopped. So everybody's attention was on the same thing. So I believe that it was a great teaching tool 
Um, I got a 12 year old daughter. And during the last, let's say five or six years, whenever something happened, you know, she would see these things on CNN and, and on the news and she would ask questions and we would have to have those uncomfortable conversations of why and how and all of these things. And I remember the first time I got stopped by the police, uh, might have been driving a little fast, I don't know, but it wasn't crazy fast, but I could see her face and her concern. That's not that's not the face that you want a child to have, a concern you want them to have when it comes to police interaction and involvement, you know, and that was way too serious uh, of a face for her to have. But the reality is a lot of us Black men have that same face. A lot of us Black people have that same face of concern when there is police interaction. So it's definitely a teaching tool and hopefully uh, it can continue to be one uh, that's a conversation piece like, like what we're having today. Thank you for that, Milton. So there are plenty of artists whose work is not a form of activism or advocacy. Sonny, can you tell us why it's important for you that your art raise awareness, amplify stories, and help inspire action to advance justice? Sure. Uh, for me personally, it was, um, you know, growing up in a very historic civil rights place where people don't really talk about those issues, um, especially not when I was growing up. And I think that um, most of the art that artists did in Montgomery were of, you know, still lifes or flowers or, you know, which is all great. But um, but the older I got and the more I started to realize, I don't know, like real issues and stories beyond what I'd grown up with, I really felt like it was important for me as an artist to use my voice to amplify those messages. I couldn't be just somebody that painted pretty flowers and, you know, um, because there, there's too much responsibility on an artist because we, you know, writers, musicians, we, we all have this gift of language that transcends uh, what we can say with our words. So I, I feel like, um, for me, um, that's just an important responsibility, you know, to hold myself accountable, to hold other people accountable for um, looking at reality. And, you know, through the lens of art, that can be easier to digest. You know, you don't have somebody verbally accosting you or something like that. Um, you know, last night I went to a concert at an independent theater here at Cloverdale Playhouse where I um, a country singer had written a song about his experience in Iran and in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't like country music. I don't really know anything about war, but his song moved me so much. I mean, I still have chills thinking about it. So, I mean, just art, art in, in every form is so powerful. And I think it can really change the way we see each other in, in the world. Thank you, Sunny. So this question is for all of you, um, for anyone who wants to answer can you share how you have witnessed art play a significant role in creating change or advancing social justice in your community or really any community if you have um, another example? Kalanji, maybe, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> Okay, well, one more time. Give give me the the question again. Yeah, so I'm just looking for an example of how art has been used um, to create, you know, as a catalyst for change, um, real tangible change in communities, either here in Montgomery um, or in in another community. Yeah, so well, I definitely think that um, the "Are you listening?" is is one of those and it was intentionally to it was intentionally um the rollout was to engage uh the community as well as um our previous uh police chief um and then of course the conversation was around um community policing and all of those things as well as um Bernard Whitehurst in that particular case, 
that uh, and that, that family was was present for the um, the unveiling. Um, so that community engagement and, and creating a space for them and and um, you know recognizing their family and you know the loss of life in their family. Um, as well as uh, open, have an opportunity to engage with um, the police force, as well as other uh, community leaders um, that kind of just it opened the door for that. Um, and that is, that particular mural is probably the most, uh, let's say controversial. I mean, we, play, we painted the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter around the fountain yeah, but I, I think that was one. You think that was one? That was the you most. Know, I, well, I think I think the one the Are You Listening probably had the most um, dialogue, you know, and yeah. and things of that nature. But us coming together for some reason, the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter at the fountain because of what the fountain was. Yeah. It seemed like that was the one that had the most interaction with the community and the talk and the engagement. Or maybe because we finished it on Juneteenth and just that energy that was present that day. I don't know, but uh, yeah. they both, I think, for the city and for what the city is and what um, Montgomery represents, I believe they, they have a major impact. How much change? You know, I don't know. I think you, your question was, how has the, the art changed? the the situation i'm not for sure how much it has changed but it's definitely brought the awareness for the conversations you know and i guess that's that's a step in the right direction yeah, yeah I'm glad I, you, oh sorry go ahead kalanji um no i was gonna say yeah and i, and I think it, it helped kind of reclaim the space and, and 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 set us in the um on the right trajectory for movement and or continuation of the movement uh, without those pieces you know, and, and how uh, the dedication as well as a celebration, um, having it done, like Milton said on Juneteenth and having the city's first time um, uh, celebrating Juneteenth. We had, uh, the mayor had just gotten elected. So all of those were, it kind of came together at one time and kind of, rebranded or just kind of rededicated that space um and and, it, and it's and it's been a reflection i mean people people always go have gone there to take pictures but it's you know they're going there in addition to just just visiting because it's a it's a fountain and it's nice to take a picture but it's the fact that it has that mural now that it kind of adds uh adds on to the conversation and really um speak to continuation of uh, the civil rights movement. I think there's a, uh, I guess in, in, in the years that the mural has been done, I'm, I'm reflecting, you know, when you ask the question, sometimes immediately you don't get the, the idea of what, how to answer and how it applies. Uh, I was a part of Leadership Montgomery and they're using it as a teaching tool with the Leadership Montgomery. So when they do their classes, uh, on Arts and Culture Day, there is a, I guess, like a mural trail, and they ask everybody to go to the murals and kind of like uh, ask them to experience it firsthand and kind of tell what you uh, what you felt based off the mural and come back and then we talk about it. So that is definitely one aspect where it has been intentional. But uh, again, they they were part of the, the the curating of it, I guess, and supporting it. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, of course, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, helped us with that department with us as well. So I forgot to mention that earlier. But again, it, it's there. And I think a lot of times when, when you experience murals and art of any kind, it's just up to the individual to, to sit with it. You know, you can't always tell a person how to feel. There, there are some people that saw the police line and it says do not cross and they saw the blood and it it made them feel different ways i remember there is a uh, a gentleman i can't think of his name but he does an am talk radio show in the um the building that was right there what's the building right there and he stopped by yeah, yeah he stopped by while i was doing it one day and he was just talking mm -hmm. to me 
And at the time, I didn't. I think he's a pastor, and I didn't know that he was, uh, you know, a radio uh, uh, host. And he was just. I think he felt like it was against the police, you know, because of how the energy was at that time. And you know, we see a lot of things, and we feel a lot of uh, different emotions when when we see our people being killed, you know, by the hands of the police. So I think he was kind of concerned and, you know, he started talking about crime and black people, but it was a, it was an interesting conversation that just sparked just from him walking by and seeing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, so I was trying to, you know, make sure that he knew that, Hey, this is, this is about making sure that we have the proper uh, conversations with, with ourselves and with the community about, how policing works you know sometimes i feel like honestly in the case of police uh we also did a ride along with uh, leadership montgomery um just the ability to be able to get mental health time for the police officers i believe that you can't police in in a lot of these places where crime or or just life life threatening situations just occur every day so you want to make sure that these men are mentally, these men and women are mentally capable of being able to help, you know, patrol our communities and not just be overwhelmed by just reacting emotionally to things, but because they may be triggered because of trauma and, you know, they almost might have been in a shootout yesterday or they saw a car flip over three times, you know, the day before, you know, they need to make sure that they're getting their mental health evaluations as well so that when they come, we know that they're whole, you know, when they're policing our communities. There was a form a few years ago and I asked, do you all, is it mandated that you all receive therapy? And they were like, no, you know, unless they shoot somebody or kill somebody, it's optional if they want to. But I think that might be something that was one of the main things that I reflect on when I think about all of these incidents, you know, being able to say, hey, I need to sit down and, and talk to somebody. I might need to pull away. And a lot of times as men, we, we may not do that, you know, yeah, thank you, Milton. So, you know, building off this conversation we're having about art having the potential to inspire action and drive systemic change. Kalanji, I'm curious about from your perspective, what are some key considerations for artists and activists when aiming to create art that not only raises awareness, but also leads to tangible and sustainable change and people taking action? Um. You said, what are some? Some key considerations. Yeah, moving people from awareness to action. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, I, I, of course, you know, running a nonprofit organization, I always think about programming. Um, so, and I also think I have a, a linear mind, like, I don't know that. Anyway. So <laughs> I'm always, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about programming and how being intentional about how do we use the, you know, the art, because I, I recognize the power of the art and, and, and the ability to, 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 you know, we always say, give a voice to the voiceless, um, you know, so I understand what it, it does and the conversations that it evoked. Um, and then so being um i don't i don't call myself an activist and i think it's kind of weird at least for me saying it uh, or anybody else saying it for that matter um but 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 coming from um a place of activism and being influenced by activists i'm always thinking about like how do we use this at, to to engage and to move things further so i think the I think that programming is something to take in consideration. And what I mean by programming is, and it could be something as simple as we have the open reception, but we also have these community talkbacks. And so that was kind of one of the themes that we at 21 Dreams uh, have been intentional about with our uh, exhibitions, whether it's public art or, you know, exhibitions for Black History Month or Women's History Month around, you know, whatever the, the, the issues are, there's always two things. 
One, because we're not subject matter specialists on, on all of the issues that we may present art for, we make sure that we bring in the subject matter, matter specialists. We had exhibitions around mass incarceration, uh, voter suppression, and the banning of critical race theory. Um, we started an initiative called We Create Change Alabama, and those were the three initial um, areas of interest that we, we created uh, art pieces uh, that, that communicated those, around those three issues. Um, so it was intentional about us bringing together partners, Alabama Rise and others um, to, to speak about, you know, what does mass incarceration and decarceration looks like, uh, abandoning a critical race theory, voter suppression and things of that nature. So I think that programming is one, um, being able to have some type of opportunity for the community to engage with whatever that is. And maybe to a certain level, just to be in the room to have a conversation. Um, and two, making sure that as artists, we're not overstepping our reach um, in terms of being able to give accurate and correct information like bringing in the subject matter specialist to, uh, to help work that out. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really great pairing to create a sort of an immersive learning space. It seems like with where you can learn about the, the topic and then you can also see how it's represented, um, in art. I think that's really cool. Um, so as Cassandra notes in the article, there's been a persistent decline in support for arts education, particularly in communities that cannot finance their own. And so we know that that disproportionately affects Black and Indigenous communities and Latin and Latinx communities, um, and that it can have dire effects on the mental health of children and youth. So Milton and Kalanji, I'm curious, um, and, and also Sunny, can you talk about the importance of funding artistic communities and learning spaces, um, both inside schools and outside schools, and how doing so can help nurture the next generation of activists? Yeah, I definitely think um, the the funding funding is important because you don't want to you don't want to place limitations on on what the possibilities are. A lot of a lot of times, like murals and things of that nature, they they cost. You know, being able to get the equipment, being able to 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 get people to come out. You know, volunteers are are great, but um, art does cost, and you you want to make sure when the opportunity to present it that you have the support that you need to be as effective um, as possible. I was fortunate enough um, to be able to do a mural in, in um, Highland Gardens Elementary just recently. And that was funded by uh, Amp, Amp Up Arts. Um, they were able to come and, and help us, to, uh, the at-risk schools. Um, they, they wanted to promote the murals in the school, you you need art in the community. So that that um, that grant was for, I think two two schools. I think maybe Chisholm, Highland Gardens, and maybe Dozier Road. But murals were done there, and just the opportunities to be in the school and engage with the kids during that time. Just seeing them come by and every day engage and see and just get excited about what they're seeing you do, and and being able to put something that's inspiring in their school. So that, that same thing applies when it's a mural in the city, like, are you listening? You know, people wanna see art in places. You know, they, they wanna be inspired. They wanna have those conversations. I think art does create that, that positive energy. So when it comes to, to school and education, I definitely believe that more funding for the arts is needed um it, it can do nothing but help you know field trips um just exposure um just the resources and whether it be steam or stem i think that those things you know that they cost unfortunately and and the arts was one of the things that um got removed from the schools early like when i was in school i had art in the sixth grade other than that i did not have art now I'm from Birmingham, maybe some people did, 
Some people didn't, depending on where they were. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Montgomery probably had, ironically, a a, a better arts program in the public school system than, than the school system that I came from. But, you know, can't say what it was for. May have been lack of funding, but arts and music had been removed from schools for, for a while. So me being able to come to Montgomery and go to college, sixth grade and college was the only time that I had exposure to the arts. So that goes without saying that a lot of that was probably because of, of funding. So I believe art helps to shape the minds and broaden the views and the spectrums of, of the people, which in turn just helps us to be more way around the people, uh, aware of situations and issues and, and teaching us how to communicate um, in a nonverbal way. And sometimes in a verbal way, you can see something creatively that can help you uh, formulate your words, that can help you figure out how you feel about a thing. You know, that, that painting, that mural may have helped you figure out, mm, been feeling a way, didn't know how to say it. That's what I, that's what I feel. That's what I want to say, you know. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I think the, the support needs to be in the funding. Well, and Milton and I have both been able to teach art in spaces that didn't have the funding. Um, Milton has taught many art classes at a nonprofit called That's My Child. Um, and I have been asked by the museum several years in a row to go as a guest artist to certain public schools. And, um, you know, Milton, you probably have the same experience as me. Uh, like you said, the, kid, the kids just light up when they realize there's this venue, there's this outlet to express things in a way that they can't otherwise so I, it's like you said it's the first thing to get pulled is the art funding but i to me it's it's the most important funding you can have for a real well-rounded person you know and and, I, and i'll just add uh I, I totally agree um i think that is important for we to to continue to have the conversation about the value of the art really amplify that because it's because a lot of times it's not valued and sometimes you have to show the numbers and show the financial numbers of of what arts and culture uh how the industry itself is doing and how it influences uh economic development and uh quality of life like you have to realize you have to amplify the importance of it and the value of it to for those that aren't artists for them to get it and understand it and to understand that um you know that that should not be uh a choice to to eliminate arts from from education um you know got to have the creative minds um and and that just like you said helps in all areas and of course um and i'm all for artists getting paid so you know uh, there's uh, creative entrepreneurs and and whether you're teaching class and all of that you know, we should also make sure the artists are paid no long gone is the starving artists we, we're not doing that no more we off that <laughs> <laughs> um so first and foremost the message is fund the arts but i i want to give some guidance maybe some tips that y'all have for how teachers might be able to integrate art um, into the classroom when it when there is no money for it, right? Sunny, I think you mentioned some creative ways in which artists are being brought to school, but do y'all have tips for how um, teachers can integrate art uh, when there's no money for it? Hmm. I, I'll mention real quick, uh, I'll go back to what, um, Milton, you mentioned, um, golly, was it Alabama? Um, what's 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 the organization? Um, actually, Alabama Arts Alliance and Amp, Amp Up Arts. And Amp Up and Amp Up Arts, correct? Yeah. Um, so one of the they have been doing a a wonderful job at addressing that particular issue. Uh, one of the ways that they are funding that is to have like for example i filmed the uh alabama's poet laureate i'm probably saying that wrong 
but uh, she's teaching poetry and it's virtually, right? The play, is, the, the goal is to, I have, uh, I think we got six videos that where she's reading and teaching small segments, segment sizes, small, small bites, but rolling that out to uh, classrooms and having that interactive teacher for once. Again, I'm arts, culture, community, and tech. So I'm always thinking about how, you know, we can uh, take advantage of the technology that we have and making sure that we're, we're reaching folk, you know, and not always have to be present. So I think like, that's one way to do it. And, you know, funding for that, I think primarily, I guess, if you're, you're paying the, the artist and the, and, and the videographer or filmmaker to create the content, the value that it has to be able to use it in, in several classes across multiple schools, um, that helps fill the gap. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, there, there is a teaching workshop that they they also uh, did where they took some local artists and we did a workshop and they they showed us how to develop curriculum if we got the opportunity to maybe do some classes or to to go into the classroom as artists as teaching artists and show how to pull the curriculum up that they may be working on. Let's say. Uh, you're in history class and you you find the curriculum and then you can develop a a piece of art or you can develop a curriculum tying into the arts based off of what the uh, actual curriculum for the classroom is. But, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, that it was uh, a bit of a challenge for me because I'm not a teacher. I am an artist and I, I don't want to murky the lines or, or uh, mm -hmm. lessen the uh, value of teachers because I believe that they are such an intricate part of, you know, the development for children. I don't want to take take that lightly. So just because you're an artist doesn't mean you're a great teacher, but the tools are there. And I think working with local artists and helping to bring them in more frequently, that is maybe one way of doing it when you maybe lack uh some of the funding maybe you could bring artists in if that school doesn't have an art class or a even if they do have an art class you know to be able to bring uh local artists in partner with um nonprofits like 21 dreams the king's canvas and just to make sure they just get exposure i, I think in most times we want to make sure that we're doing something and reaching back out but it's just how we coordinated and make it happen. You know, most most artists, they definitely want to be a part of that growth in, in, the, in the arts community for kids so that we can be the seed, we help plant that seed that continues to grow, you know, those young creators, those, those young artists to, to develop them in the arts as well. Yeah, thanks, Milton. I know one thing I was thinking about is and maybe this, it might cost a little money, but I know some uh, schools still do field trips. And I'm thinking about the the mural, the street mural around the, the fountain in Montgomery. And we have a lot of students that come through, you know, they visit the SPLC, um, the CRMC Center across the street. Um, I'm sorry, that's totally different. But Field trips are, are happening still, and they they visit some of the landmarks in Montgomery, and a lot of people are doing walking tours. And if you look around Montgomery, there's art everywhere, including that downtown fountain. That is a very intentional piece and a very powerful piece because of its location. The fact that it's there, and I think there's a historical marker where that is painted, about what happened on that site. And it's the teachable moment. And it's an, it, it's an opportunity for educators to engage with that art and students in that way, um, to connect the pieces. Like, what, it is, what does it mean to have a spot where enslaved Africans were auctioned? And now in that same spot, you have a, this bold art that says Black Lives Matter. And I think that's a way to honor the history tell the truth about the history and get kids to engage in ways that you can tell your stories and tell the history and, 
and promote justice through the art. Um, through field trips, through walking tours. Um, I think that's a possibility for educators, and not just educators, but families, parents can um, can reach into their own communities and find way, find the art. Sometimes it's just standing right there in front of you. I know if you go a block around downtown uh, Montgomery, there's a mural everywhere. There's statues, there's... Um, sculptures there's a lot to to take in and i think um that could be considered on uh, somebody's agenda for their field trip yeah so building off this um conversation about art is like a powerful tool for educators um sunny i'm curious if you can talk about how you think um art can be used to facilitate classroom conversations or create immersive learning experiences or inspire critical thinking um, for folks who are inside the school building? That's a great question. Um, I will say just from um, the past year's mural that Kalanji and I partnered with SPLC and 12 high school students to paint. Um, the, the mission was to paint um, what, what, S, what SPLC's four, four values were, and it was like eradicating poverty, um, dis, dismantling white supremacy. So what we had those students do, breaking up into different groups, was research what does your, um, what does your, section mean like what does eradicating poverty mean what is you know so looking into those topics and um and then the students started sharing articles with us and each other and you could just see their brains turning and 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 so then to have to come up with sketches about that and work as a group and um which artists we don't always play well in a group but you know, that's, that's part of that's part of learning too but um but yeah, just uh, and Kalanji can speak to that it's to, to see going from concept to you know sketch to ex execution um, was was an entire learning process that wasn't just about I don't know it's one specific skill. It was just a comprehensive experience um, that they learned and and grew from. So I think that um, you know any any sort of projects like that where, you know, even at a young age when I've seen, you know, students having to do critical thinking around yeah. something that they've never really thought of before intentionally, you know, and for me, I wasn't presented with these, um, you know, conversations until I, I was in late high school, early college, you know, so to have those conversations even younger is, is I think, a great opportunity uh, to you know, like Milton said earlier, be able to express what you're feeling through art and, you know, and, and it, it was, um, it was a really interesting process, uh, to say the least, but I, I think that's, you know, and, and we even did that with a, um, elementary school was that, that, uh, what tap, I can't remember what elementary school it was, but we did a paper mural so the mm. so the kids were um you know all in a group activity and i th i think it's um i think it's good to be able to work on your own but i think it's also good to work together um because i know working with milton and kalanji all the time i mean we're we're a part of this art community together we can constantly feed off of each other and bounce ideas off of each other so um so i think you know not only conversations around art and activism, but also being able to form a community, um, you know, around that is, is just as important. So, yeah. yeah thank you for that, Sunny. Yeah. Um, Kalanji, you mentioned earlier um, the banning of critical race theory and sort of touched on classroom censorship. So we're ex we know we're experiencing now a wave of classroom censorship affecting schools from book bans to legislation attempting to censor curriculum and limit classroom discussions about race, racism, gender identity, and sexual orientation. So um, we know that families and communities are using art as a tool for public education. 
Um, can you share why uh, you believe it's important that learning is not just limited to the classroom and how art can be a part of that? Um, and for anyone who wants to share, I know Kalanji that you did specifically a project on this, but um, I also would love to know, um, you know, how you think that artists can also be part of the pushback against classroom censorship. Mm. Yeah, so um, as a storyteller, I, I think one way that I've been um, sort of, I guess, combating that, um, one, I love history. <laughs> so that's also, that's like a natural thing for me. Uh, I love art and I love art I love, and I love history. Um, so documentary storytelling or even short form or history storytelling projects uh, is one of the things that I've been working on um, with an organization out of Birmingham uh, into compiling. I think we have about 42 interviews to do from historical uh, sites throughout Alabama um, at all the civil rights sites. So essentially with that project, and just to give an example, that project allows that continuation of history that is, is, is history preservation. It is, um, it allows for intergenerational conversation. Um, and we're real intentional about how we're developing these pieces um, because we know that what we're fighting against, you know, if we don't capture um, the history and especially from those who experienced it through their words, uh, you know, we, we could we could lose it. And so it's, it is the intergenerational and, and knowledge transfer that's happening uh, as we're, we're capturing those stories. I think that outside of, you know, whether it's filmmaking, uh, podcast work, um, the, the, the visual representations of the murals and things of that age, I think all, all of those things help with um, uh, fighting against that. The other thing is, um, you know, continue to bring, using that as to bring awareness that that's what's going on. I think that also, um, you know, engages and in, 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 in kind of, um, you know, get, get the community fired up. I'll, I'll let the last thing I'll, I'll say, my experience with how um, art can be that vehicle uh, was was first through music. Uh, I'm a huge hip hop head. Uh, I grew up listening to the likes of Public Enemy, X Clan, um, Poor Righteous Teachers, Tribe Called Quest, and I think unlike now, um, we had a at that time period, we had like we were coming off of the 60s and 70s uh, civil rights movement. Like, and wow. these, yeah. So we, we the artists that were creating hip hop were children of those uh, those people. Um, and so it was it was an easy transfer for them now to create music. And that music helped inspire me at, at a young age, like listening to listening to those lyrics and and the names that they they would always drop names in this. And I, again, I'm curious. I'm young. I'm curious. I started looking at who is this person? Who's this? Who's that? And I'm learning more. Um, and it does it does well for just uh, and I think, yeah, it does well for for building building community um sense of pride all of those things really help bring forth who i am today and that started through hip-hop music and it started through those stories those lyrics the the education um you know that was outside of the classroom that wasn't my 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 history teacher teaching me those things that was chuck d and <laughs> you know all of those guys they would like telling you what's going on and uh, and then outside of that, it went to filmmaking, and I started to um, 
I always had a vivid imagination. So listening to songs, I would always imagine what the video would look like. And then so Spike Lee and others like that to start telling telling stories. And that was just like, okay, I'm, I'm in heaven. Nah, I'm just going to have to love this art stuff and pursue it. But yeah. I love that Kalanji. So we're nearing the end of our time. I just have one um, final question for Cassandra. Um, what do you hope people take away from this story and what action steps do you think they should consider? Um, I think a couple of things. Uh, to Kalanji's point, there are so many ways that we can learn outside of the classroom. Like all of our learning doesn't happen in the classroom. And um, there's there's ways to learn our history and to learn about our communities outside of the classroom. And art is one way to do that. Art is a, is a way to be expressive and speak tr uh, truth to power. Um, so I hope that that's that this article is a reminder that, you know, there's learning opportunities outside of the classroom. As far as an action step, I think what's important to remember, or hopefully people are charged to get in where they fit in. Um, you don't have to be on the front lines of marches. You don't have to be the charismatic speaker. There are many ways to call attention to a, a cause or to be a part of the movement. And everyone has a role to, to play in documenting history, expressing yourself through art. Um, that's, that's just one way to do that. We know a lot about the civil rights movement through the photographer Gordon Parks. Like where would our conversations be if we didn't have that documented the way that he did? So I think um, even though he wasn't like at the front lines or he wasn't a so-called leader, he was of the movement, he was integral to the movement. And because of his artwork, we got a lot of the pieces. We were able to visualize what actually happened. Um, so it's just a matter of finding your place, whether that's art or another way, maybe it's poetry, to, uh, to be a part of the movement for social justice and, and inclusive education and to keep learning. Thank you for that great advice, Cassandra. Uh, so we are near the end of our time. So let me take a few minutes to share some information with you. Our next summer read along is set for 3.30 p.m. Central on Wednesday, July 12th. Uh, that conversation will center on power and justice in the South and beyond. And you can register uh, at the link in the chat. Uh, so we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, applications open July 31st for our next professional learning cohorts, which will focus on teaching hard history and critical practices for social justice education. You can find those applications on the professional development section of our website, and I encourage you to apply. Uh, don't forget to sign up to receive your free subscription to Learning for Justice magazine. We're happy to send that to your school or to your home or wherever you like. Um, and as always, you can find all of our resources at learningforjustice.org. Finally, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for such a wonderful dialogue on a truly important topic. Uh, thank you to everyone at LFJ working behind the scenes today to make this a success. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. We're really happy um, that you could share this space with us. And I hope you'll take the next couple of minutes to fill out an evaluation about your experience today. We really value your input and insight. So we're gonna drop that in the chat and you can take the next few minutes to, um, to share some insight with us. And again, thank you so much for being here. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day.